Are you ready for Quick Talks? Yeah. yeah! I want to be absolutely sure there's no confusion with another less popular short presentation format that's occasionally seen on Facebook. Uh, there's no guy named Ted in this involved here today. Our branded, our uh, Quick Talks color is not red. We don't even have a brand color. We don't have a brand. We just have some very serious people who have a sense of urgency about their topic. So I'm sure you're thinking, you know, I aspire to get to this quick talk stage. How do I get this incredible opportunity? <laughs> Michael's like loosening up. Um, here's how. Someone on the conference program committee puts you up to it, and then there's a lot of admiration that goes on. Like, who? yeah, Don and Michael and Marissa. So here's how. Um, let me introduce our three esteemed, esteemed Quick Talk speakers. First on stage will be Marisa Bunning on home canning and home fermented foods. Marisa is Associate Professor and Extension Food Safety Specialist at Colorado State University. In her work as an Extension Specialist, she assists in the development of educational programming and food safety resources. Her efforts in the classroom and through outreach are focused on a systems approach to food safety advocacy. You can read her full bio on page 29 in your program book. Second will be Michael Robertson on reusable shopping bags. Michael is Director of Corporate Quality Assurance with Public Supermarkets of Lakeland, Florida. Some of you got to visit uh, part of Publix on Wednesday. He leads a team of professionals responsible for food safety, brand integrity, and regulatory compliance programs related to products and labeling throughout the Publix supply chain. He's actively engaged in development of strategic food protection and quality assurance systems. He, we're very pleased he currently sits on the board of directors of the Partnership for Food Safety Education. And you can read much more about Michael on page 31 of your program. Finally, we're pleased to have on stage for Quick Talks Don Schaffner. He's going to serve as your moderator, expert, all around Quick Talks guy. Uh, he's going to be talking about home delivery services and meal kits. Don Schaffner is an extension specialist in food science and distinguished professor at Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey. Do I have that right? Great. His research interests include quantitative micro microbial risk assessment, predictive food microbiology, hand washing, and cross-contamination. He's authored more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and numerous book chapters and abstracts. In 2009, he was awarded the IAFP Elmer Marth Educator Award for outstanding service to the public in the area of food safety and food protection education. He's been elected a fellow of IFT, of the American Academy for Micro Microbiology, and of IAFP. Don is co-host of a podcast on microbial food safety, and his full bio is on page 32. So, okay, we're ready to begin. Uh, we're going to do each, each speaker gets five minutes. They're going to be timed. Hold your questions until Don begins the facilitated portion of the session. Um, I wouldn't advise a trip to the restroom right now because you might, these are quick, and you might miss it. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Bunning for Quick Talks. We're talking sauerkraut, shopping, and shipping. All right. I'm from Colorado State University, and in Colorado, fermentation is very popular. We're um, a huge beer production state, and because of that, there's a great interest not only in brewing, but also in um, fermentation of food products. So several years ago, our food safety team started being pulled kind of down the fermentation pathway, but along the way, we discovered some interesting um, opportunities that we didn't really expect, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. So uh, Jay Leno joked a few years ago that students at CSU could major in beer and minor in weed science. That's not exactly true, but we have to embrace 
the issues and interests of our states. In our case, it happened to be fermentation. So it, it did make sense as food safety educators because fermentation is one of the oldest types of preservation, uh, thousands of years old actually, but it was not one that we were that familiar with. But if you think about types of preservation, fermentation's different than those. Because with most types of fermentation, you want to maintain the quality and characteristics of the original food, but with fermentation, you want to steer the process to change that. We don't want sauerkraut that tastes like shredded cabbage, and we don't want yogurt that has a consistency of milk. You're, you're guiding a process, so you have to have a different mind, mindset for that. So um, join me if you want to. Put your right hand up in the air and go in a clockwise direction. This is us as food safety educators and how we feel about microorganisms. Then bring it down below eye level. And you're not going across, you're not going in clockwise direction anymore. So as food safety educators, we, um, we have a certain um, attitude toward pathogenic microorganisms, and it's, it's pretty antagonistic, right? Fight back. And we, we have brains, we have smartphones, we have these wonderful networks, and yet, Salmonella, we had a record number of out, multi-state outbreaks last year. So it's frustrating. We're, I, you know, they're single-celled organisms, but they're very resourceful. So the nice thing about fermentation is you get to, to look, look at things a different way. And it is hard for us to look at embracing and promoting the growth of microorganisms in food. It takes a little while to, to shift gears like that. But once you do, then you get, to use, um, you get to use the beneficial fermenting microorganisms as your allies. And they help you. And we're the perfect educators for this because we know that what microorganisms need. We know they need food, they need moisture, they need time, they need temperature. We can guide them uh, just as we have tried to prevent them from you know, using that same information to prevent them. And then the fermenting organisms work with us because then they will um, produce acid, lower the pH. So it's, so it's a really synergistic process. So I want to encourage you um, to consider using it as a tool to teach people uh, about the presence of microorganisms because we often try to say, oh, they're everywhere, you just can't see them. And this, it gets to be um, fun in a different way too because usually we don't have proof of process. If we're successful, it's the absence of illness. We don't have something you know, to show at the end. We don't want to have something to show. But with fermentation, you get proof of process. You, if you do it correctly, you have the desirable product at the end. So it, so it is, it is you know, just an interesting, different way uh, to look at microorganisms. There were uh, a couple of things I did want to mention, though. So this whole idea of probiotics, prebiotics, and gut health is an evolving science. So we, um, we're not trying to, to promote the consumption of, of fermented foods. It's traditionally, they've been condiments. They complement or they um, you know, uh, contribute to a dish or to a meal. So we're not saying that fermented foods are the new fruits and vegetables. We're just saying it's, it's an interesting way uh, to embrace a culture that's been around for a long time and you know, to go into that direction. So uh, you know, just encourage you to take a harder look at, at um, fermented foods and beverages. And the other benefit, one of the other benefits is if you know any home brewers or you know any commercial brewers, they may have told you that they spend 75 to 90 percent of their time cleaning. Near and dear to our hearts, hygiene and uh, good practices are absolutely necessary for fermentation, and that fits in our wheelhouse too. So, it's our time. I think that's about it. My name is Michael Robertson. I'm the director of food safety and quality assurance with Public Supermarkets, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about one thing that I really like: reusable shopping bags. Because I think that, not just reusable shopping bags, but this, this concept, there's this concept where we're really at an interface now. 
we're in an interface where we're seeing some competing values. We're seeing competing values of food safety and sustainability. And the question that I'd like, like to pose to all of you is, what value is more important to you? Food safety or sustainability? When we talk about reusable shopping bags, for our company at Publix, over the last 10 years, they've skyrocketed. We have sold more than four billion reusable shopping bags, four billion. Um, I'm sorry, we've sold more of these shopping bags, saving four billion paper and plastic bags, which is great for sustainability. Recently, there's been a lot of chatter, a lot of conversation about, well, could these contribute to food safety opportunities? But I'd perhaps share that this isn't really anything new. If you go back to 2005, there was a Harvard Business Review Journal, April 2005, that talked about introduction of these reusable shopping bags and that it's contributing to an increase of both organic and junk food, um, but it's increasing to a, an increase of, of food intake from shoppers. As a retailer, I like that. But then fast forward to, to 2010, it was the first time that a publication came out, Dr. Chuck Gerba at the University of Arizona published some interesting findings that these reusable shopping bags may be contributing to a higher propensity of food contamination. How often do these get clean? Do consumers know how to clean them? If you look inside your bag, it says, can you get a, a close-up on that? Oh, he can. <laughs> He's going to try. It says, do not bleach, line dry, do not iron, and hand wash cold. Who thinks that's good enough? <laughs> yeah, as food safety professionals, I think we can do a little better. I think we can do a little better. I, I want to say Michigan State University, um, and I did my, my, my master's program at Michigan State, so plug out to, to you guys at Michigan State. <laughs> Their extension group has some really great information about cleaning you know, reusable shopping bags. It talks about the importance of using warm, soapy water. It talks about the importance of drying them and keeping them in a, in a dry place and not leaving them in your trunk, right? What else is in your trunk? Well, if you go back again, go back in time about 10 years ago, I think it was either in Washington or Oregon. I'm sorry, I'm here in the southeast, so I, I get states out west confused a little bit. But there was a state out west, and I think that there was a publication, uh, or the, not a public, there was a publication in the Journal of Infectious Disease that talks about some soccer girls, youth soccer league. And there was, there was a soccer tournament. Mom decided they were going to have some food for the team. They threw in some prepackaged snacks, they took the bag with them of food, went to the locker room, left it in the locker room. They're playing their tournament. They come back in and they get their food, about 24, 48 hours later, you had a team full of norovirus. So if this issue of sustainability and food safety, they're in an interface. They're in an interface, and we have to figure out as a society, how are we going to live between the two of these? Because they're both extremely important values to our customers, and we have to figure out how they work together. Some of the challenges we're also seeing is that in some of the local municipalities, you know, Dr. Sandy Good Godwin, she, she talked about the Don't Wing It campaign. Some of y'all were in her room. What do we, what's one of those steps when you get the, the chicken? You wrap it up in a plastic bag and then you step, set it into the final grocery bag. There's a number of local municipalities throughout the country that are banning various forms of plastic. You all have heard about straws, right? And straws are really important. We, 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 we must save the wildlife. But food safety opportunities in the store, we had to go to a local town and here in the southeast not too long ago, and we spoke with the local uh, authorities in the town because they want to eliminate all plastic in the store. What are customers going to put their drinks in? What are customers going to put lids on? What's the deli going to put their meats in? Because it's by the ordinance, you can't use plastic anymore. So again, what's more important, food safety or sustainability? I'll leave you with that thought. 
I, I promise I'm not actually tweeting during my presentation. My notes are here on my phone. So, um, so I, I have the uh, challenge of trying to summarize the last four years, actually six or eight years of work we've been doing, we and others have been doing on this topic. So I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, maybe at the beginning by telling you a story. And this, this is a story of how we got interested in, in this area. Uh, my colleague, uh, Bill Hallman, who's a faculty member at Rutgers University in, uh, in the human ecology department. Um, Bill uh, is a speaker and presenter, and he you know, travels, uh, travels the world giving talks, and he gave a great talk one day, and somebody, to express their thanks to Bill, they sent him a gift in the mail. And what that gift was, was perishable food. And, and Bill, unfortunately, was, was traveling, and uh, he didn't get to that perishable food right away. And when and, and the people who, who sent him the gift, there was, there was no notifications, no information on the outside of the package. The people that received it didn't know that it was perishable food. And so when Bill finally discovered that package and opened up, he opened up a package full of spoiled food. And that, that gave him the idea, hey, maybe this is a, a topic, a food safety topic and a, and a food quality topic that's worth exploring. So, he teamed up with uh, Sandy Godwin, whose name was just mentioned a few minutes ago, from Tennessee State, and Bill and Sandy wrote a grant proposal um, to USDA that was successfully funded. And I had the pleasure to be, to be part of that proposal. Um, and they, we discovered through that research a whole bunch of different things in terms of how uh, food is shipped, the kind of packaging material, uh, the, the degree of temperature control, um, and it really, there's, again, I could do a, a whole half hour on, on the findings of that uh, study, which I'm not going to do, but I want to share a couple of key points. One key point was that there was a tremendous amount of variability in what we received in terms of the quality of the packaging material, in terms of the types of uh, dunnage or filler material that were used, a lot of variability in terms of what was used to cool the, the package. Many, uh, many of the packages we ordered had um, uh, the, the gel packs. Some, of them, some packages used dried ice. Um, some packages actually used uh, you know, regular wet ice. Um, and, and those, I can tell you, were a sopping wet mess when they, when they arrived uh, at, at the various locations. Um, we saw a tremendous diversity of surface temperatures on the products when we received them. We saw a tremendous diversity of total plate count, and we found pathogens in, in many of those packages. When we look at the correlation between temperature and total plate count, I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing that I do. I like to do regression analysis and look for correlations. There was no correlation whatsoever. Temperature was all over the place, um, and, and micro counts were all over the place, and it was basically just a, a flat wall of points. It was just basically any possibility of, of temperature and plate count that you could imagine was, was on that. There was no, there was no uh, correlation analysis whatsoever. Um, I also want to clarify a key point. And I heard a speaker uh, earlier today uh, talking about meal kits, and she mentioned uh, the Rutgers study on meal kits. I, I want to be very, very clear that the work that, that, that Rutgers did and Tennessee State did was not on meal kits per se. It was on mail order meat and poultry and seafood. So we didn't buy from Blue Apron, right? We didn't order from Amazon Fresh. We did order from companies like Omaha Steaks, okay? So, so when you're thinking, and, and, and I have to say, it, many, many of you maybe became aware of this when you saw a headline that was published on Food Safety News, and unfortunately, the, the headline describing the study was accurate, but then they used a picture of one of these meal, meal kit delivery services, okay? And so they, they kind of contributed to maybe some false advertising there. So they did actually eventually go and, and change the image when we, when we reported, reported, that, uh, reported it to them. Okay, so flash forward now to 2016. And the, we've, uh, Rutgers and Tennessee State presented their findings to USDA, Food Safety Inspection Service. Uh, FSIS was, you know, 
startled and maybe a little bit alarmed by, uh, by what we found. And again, many of the things that we ordered were meat and poultry, so theoretically coming under FSIS's purview. Um, and so they wrote an issue to the Conference for Food Protection to charge a committee to develop a guidance document for the safety of mail order foods. And I had the privilege of serving uh, as part of that committee and we wrote um, what I thought was a, a really good guidance document. Um, in part, it was based on, because all of these, these kind of expert guidance documents they always rely on the guidance that's come before. Um, there was a, a wonderful document from the United Kingdom on safety of mail order foods, and so we use that as kind of a template for crafting our, our own document. And that's actually available <coughs> today on the Conference for Food Protection website. So if you, if you need some help in locating that, uh, that guidance document, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, uh, that guidance document focused only on mail order foods. And so uh, uh, 2018 CFP comes along, the issue is, uh, the, the report is presented, and the committee, uh, or a, a, a modified version of the committee gets re-chartered. And that committee is focusing not only on mail order foods, but now third party delivery services. So, so things like Uber Eats and Grubhub and Instacart and things like that. And so now we have a wonderful committee, we're working very hard, I'm, I'm chairing that committee, we're meeting every two weeks, we're working to revise the existing guidance document to now include these even more novel business practices. Um, and we're not the only ones doing this. There's a couple of other folks that are active as well. Um, AFTO has a committee that's looking at the safety of these food products and possibly developing uh, regulations or, or, or additional guidance. And then finally, most recently, I'm wrapping up, I promise. Um, uh, GFSI uh, has, has chartered a technical working group to look at this issue and to see whether it needs, uh, uh, needs to be in, uh, covered under the GFSI umbrella. So, so that is a whirlwind tour of, let's say, the last six years of uh, mail order food and third party delivery service work that I've been involved with. All right, so we're gonna bring everybody up. Oh, oh, sorry, my challenge question is how, <laughs> forgot the punchline. How do we assure food safety for novel forms of food delivery? And, I, and notice the way that that's phrased. I didn't talk about meal kits or mail order or third party delivery services. We're living in a world that where innovation is happening. And believe me, the, all the possible business models that are out there have not yet been delivered yet, right? Have not been, been realized yet. And so we're going to increasingly have even more novel forms of, of food delivery. And we're gonna, we as, a, as food safety educators, as regulators, as folks in the industry, we're gonna have to come to grips with how do we actually assure food safety across all of those, those novel aspects, including scientific solutions and regulatory solutions, et cetera. So, so that's the question I have for you. How are we gonna do that? Thanks. Mary Choate from the University of New Hampshire Extension. So I'm concerned about everything you all talked about, particularly the bags. Um, so Michael, I think my understanding about that incident was that the problem was that the bag, it could have been any kind of bag, yeah. was in the locker room where people were coughing and hacking and maybe flushing the toilet. I don't know what, what was in this locker room. Not so much the bag was the, was the problem, but the fact of the food was in a place where food shouldn't be stored. But I might be wrong about that, but that's the impression I got. But my bigger question is, so you're right, all these places are banning plastic bags. That's a whole, that's an issue. But what are we gonna, has there really been a food safety outbreak traced to cloth bags? Has there been? I mean, there's all this like talk about, oh, you can't clean them and the, you know, it lives forever in the, in the cre crevices. And, but does that translate into food safety outbreaks? If people just threw them in the wash with bleach, even if it says don't bleach them, would that be adequate? Or is it adequate right now because there's no food safety outbreaks that I'm aware of connected to cloth bags? Yeah, oh. Mary, that's a great question. <laughs> and, and I don't know the answer to your question of documented foodborne illness outbreaks. But you know, I, I know what I hear and what I see even within my own community. And it might be you know, going to the Girl Scout meeting and everybody's pulling these bags out of their trunks. And when my wife goes and buys groceries every week, it, those bags go right back into the same trunk. And where do we place those bags? I think there was another uh, uh, speaker this morning that talked about that box and when that box of the meal kits came and they set it onto the, the table. Oh, well now I've contaminated everything again, right? So there's a lot of unknowns and I think that there, there certainly is a propensity. We, we have a risk assessor with us who could probably address the risk of it way better than I could. But certainly the volume of more and more recyclable bags, different bags that may or may not be clean, 
I, I don't think it takes science to say that that does increase the possibility of foodborne illnesses occurring. Yeah, well, and I'll say, based on the rate that I seem to accumulate bags, if you, and if you, are any, if you guys are anything like me, um, we could probably, at my house, just afford to throw them out instead of washing them, and we would still have plenty of bags. I mean, I should send you some pictures, Michael. Uh, we keep them in the, in the, we have two cars, and usually there's more than enough bags for like five grocery trips yeah. in each of the two cars, right? right? So, um, uh, but I think in terms of risk, uh, you know, if you think about it, it makes, it, it's a dry surface. We know from research that my, our lab and others have done, transfer from dry surfaces is relatively low. I mean, certainly there are situations where if a bag gets wet, if it falls out of the car and goes, gets in a mud puddle and somebody runs over it, you know, those are situations where you just ought to toss that bag. But I would say in terms of daily use, I think it's relatively low risk. And I know, like when we go to the store, it, we buy fresh produce, we put that produce in a plastic yeah. bag. But, but because we are very uh, concerned about not uh, having unnecessary plastic, that those plastic bags that the produce comes in, they get repurposed. Mm -hmm. And they go into a place in the closet and they are what we call the dog poop bags. <laughs> and, and, and so those bags get one more final use to pick up some dog poop, which goes into the, to, to the, to the trash at the end of the week. So you know that way I feel like I'm sort of saving the planet and I'm, I'm picking up uh, my dog's poop. So. You're definitely being sustainable there, Don. Can, can I have a, I have a follow-up, a sure. bag-related follow-up. So here's something I experienced. I mean, I like farmer's markets. I like supporting local food, like, like, like all that stuff. But when I go to the farmer's market, if I don't, if I, like, happen to stop by one without my bags and they offer to put my lettuce or whatever in a bag they happen to have with them, right, their <laughs> grocery bags, I'm like, uh, no, I'll just carry it. Because I don't know what that bag has had right. in it, and neither do they. I mean, they could have had shoes or could have had nothing. Or could have, yep. You know what I mean? So what do you... Do you have any advice for about like farmers markets and reusing? Uh, the common thing is using them using plastic bags that they have from their house. Well, as a retail grocer, I'm going to say, come to our store. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, yeah, I, if if I'm going to go to the Saturday farmers market, I, I'm more likely going to bring my own bag because I know how I've handled it and how we've cleaned it, and I know we're really an exception to the masses out there. Yeah. I don't know how to advise farmers market people. To, you know what I mean? I don't. I, would you say go ahead, use, stop using those bags or use those bags? I don't know what the answer is there because it, it could be risky, yeah. but it is handy for people that didn't bring their own bags. You know what's interesting? There is a cottage foods industry guidance that was developed by the Associ Association of Food and Drug Officials oh. about 10 years ago, and I don't think they really addressed different reusable bag scenarios. So that might be a great idea, Mary, for us to use with our partners at AFTO and, and a possible you know, revision to that guidance. Well, and in fact, I know like uh, some of my colleagues uh, around the country are doing research on safety of farmer's markets. Kathy Cutter had a great paper that appeared in Food Protection Trends. Mm -hmm. That's a plug, David, no, no, no charge for that. I'd give you that one for free. Uh, the, the great journal Food Protection Tr Trends published by IAFP. Um, and uh, Kathy's, Kathy's article talked about the safety of farmer's markets. Well, those of my colleague, and I know Ben uh, Chapman um, uh, is also very interested in this subject. For those of us that are working in that area, maybe that, that should be something that they could study or come together as a group, again, to provide some guidance to help those folks that are selling foods at farmer's markets. Because I, I, don't, I don't think the science is necessarily clear, but there probably are some best practices that could be developed. So sure. more work for educators. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Really interesting talks. Go ahead. Uh, this is Zhen Dongyan uh, uh, from uh, Walmart for Safety Collaboration Center in China. Um, we also think about the sustainability and the food safety and uh, we open for all the proposals to look at innovation technology. One thing come out from all our the, uh, proposals, which is people looking into in some of the material. Uh, nanotechnology is one of these technology that can uh, really help the, the uh, insulation and uh, help the cleaning and sanitation. So we are not use bags, mm -hmm. but use wrap. So you can open that to clean the sun has much, much better, much, much easier. The other way, uh, Dan, uh, Dan talked about the use of food delivery boxes. There's a million, million of those boxes in China on the street. You can see the back of the scooters. They deliver food to the uh, household. 
uh, the office uh, uh, places. And uh, we also think about how, you know, hot food, cold food, all those how can sep do the separation. So, and we also think about use this uh, nanotechnology, this wrap set to have good separation. So this is something I just want to comment on that. We, we can look into those innovation and find the solution. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a brief comment and let the other panelists respond, and then I've actually got a, a, a question uh, that occurred to me about um, Marisa's um, uh, uh, talk, so that's just coming in a minute. But yeah, so I think that this whole idea of controlled release uh, packaging, I know I've got some colleagues at Rutgers that are working on this, um, and the trick is, of course, you have to, to have the appropriate technology, you have to have the appropriate plastic, you have to have the appropriate agent, you have to study the rate at which it gets released. Is it in contact with the food or is it in contact with air? I mean, so there's, yeah, for sure there's, there's technologies out there that can be used to raise the level of safety for these, for these bags. I think to, to Michael's point though, when he read the label, that was quite an eye opener to me. I think that maybe one of the things that we could do is encourage those that are manufacturing the bags to make bags that are machine washable, that are bleachable, and you know, and honestly, I would disregard that tag if it was my house. I'd put it in the washing, and then you know, again, I, I've got I've got more than enough bags in my. You know, I, could, I could equip a couple tables here um, uh, with with reusable bags from what's in my cars right now. So, and, and then again, if the bags fall apart, then just throw them away. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I yeah. So let me let me let me ask the question. So. Um, we're getting, we as extension folks are getting more and more questions about fermentation. And what I'm wondering, and one of the things people are worried about is salt in their diet. And so a question that I've had a couple of times in, in recent months is, I have this recipe that I got off the internet, um, but I've turned it into a low salt mm -hmm. sauerkraut or whatever, kimchi recipe. Mm -hmm. um, do you, are there bright lines? And I lo I've looked at some of the stuff that you guys have on your website and others as well, and nobody seems to exactly agree, but is, is there, are there some uh, generic recommendations we can give people like, you know, don't go below X percent salt or, you know, uh, or, or, you know, your fermentations need to be conducted at these temperatures. Are there some, and again, I know every vegetable is different, et cetera, et cetera, but are there some, are there some kind of bright lines that we can say definitely don't play outside these lines? Well, I should have mentioned that we encourage people to follow the traditional recipes, and um, by that I mean uh, a credible recipe, recipe for fermentation that they can find from extension or from, from reliable sources. And it, that is tough because there are not very many um, options out there, but we also encourage them not to, not to change anything because it changes the whole, uh, the safety level that they, they uh, we try to guide them if they're looking for something and they don't have anything that's available. But um, that's, we, we emphasize that these are, these are traditional foods, that they need to embrace that concept, mm -hmm. and, and it's not the place to be creative. Yeah, yeah, good, thanks. I see we have someone at the mic here. Yes, I'm Brian Severns from uh, K-State Olathe, and I'm a fermentation guy. Um, so uh, yes. my research says 2% salt, is about the top end and about 1.5 on sauerkraut okay, is okay. the low end, so there's that. Um, so, so you're saying don't go higher than two and don't go lower than 1.5? Correct. Okay. okay. Um, Marissa, do you have strong um, data on the, the ability of the fermenting bugs to outcompete the pathogens such as salmonella and things like that, and if so, can you find a way to get it out there to the millennials and those people who are really jumping on this bandwagon? Well, the, the short answer is no. That, that the uh, validation studies um, haven't been done for most of the fermentation products. And that's one of the reasons that we, um, we and that's the other point that's important to know about fermentation is that the consumer shouldn't expect it to be a long-term type of food preservation, that um, yogurt will last longer than milk, but yogurt won't last as long as canned peaches. We're talking about fresh ferments, and we've done studies to make sure that um, pH of the, the recipes that we're suggesting, that we know the, the, um, the, for the amount of time that we're suggesting that they keep the product, that, uh, that P, the pH is staying in a, at a safe level. Mm -hmm. 
So that's another, just a recommendation. And part of the training is, you know, that, that the, these products weren't built to last longer than what is recommended. Sure. So, but well, we, if you ever want to do those validation studies, give us a call. Well, it's, we're, it's a new program, so we're, we're, we're hoping to move to more toward that. Good. So I don't, I don't see, oh, I see somebody making their way to the mic. Oh, excellent. Hi. One quick question. Hi, Kathy Savoy with the University of Maine. I appreciate you talking about fermentation because it is such a cutting edge issue. Mm -hmm. In Maine, we too share um, a large group of people who are very interested in fermentation. And what we have um, come to the conclusion is, is that we need to play a role in helping to inform them. So we are offering classes on fermentation and kombucha, and they come. And so it becomes an opportunity for us to be able to educate them on what are um, the safety steps. There was a recent article in Food Protection Trends around kombucha yeah. and what are the safety steps. So it, it again gives us that opportunity, but I do um, firmly believe we have to start to educate people with where they're at and not ignore where their interests are. So thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, how are we on time? Okay, let me, let me just do a quick survey. Um, how many of you have ever um, ordered uh, food over the internet? So whether that's Omaha Steaks or, or um, Amazon Fresh or, or Blue Apron. Or from the Publix Deli. Or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so how many of you currently subscribe to a service that sends you stuff through the mail? Okay, how many of you have subscribed to a service and then stopped? <laughs> For any of you that, that subscribed and stopped, what are the reasons you stopped? I'm just curious. Shout it out. Quality. Quality? Too, much Too much packaging. Too expensive. No Cost? No time to cook. No time to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Donna? <laughs> Good. All right. Um, and now, thank you for that. I've, I've, I've no, no, this is not going to be published in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm just curious. Um, so uh, how many of you have used a third-party delivery service like Uber Eats or Instacart or Grubhub? How many of you consider yourself regular users of that service? I know Donna's hand is going up. I, we've talked about this. Um, for those of you that use, and I, so I, we, 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 we have used meal kit delivery services, and I have ordered food over the internet. Um, we don't use any of these delivery services. For those of you that use those delivery services, what are the reasons why you choose to use them? Convenience? Is that it? <laughs> Has anybody? Convenience uh, is king, Don. Has anybody, yeah, yeah the Publix Deli is yeah. very convenient, I hear. Um, so, ha, ha, oh, you don't drive, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really essential. There you go, there you go. You could, you could take Uber to go somewhere, or Uber could bring the food to you. It works, works either way. Perfect. I'm not, I don't work for Uber. Um, so, well, that's, that's good. Well, oh, wait, question or comment? Timing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's fast. Has anybody has anybody ever had a bad experience either with a meal kit delivery service or or with a, 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 a third party delivery? Go, tell tell us. Can you go to the microphone and tell us your story? Would you be willing to do that? We have like four minutes, so no problem. So, on, so my team. So I work for USDA. I have a team of about twelve people. And we love food, obviously. Everyone in this room loves food. So we have a lot of, of uh, birthdays and, and uh, you know, somebody's getting married or something, and we're, we get food a lot. Um, we have good and bad experiences, especially with all of these um, things. So we had a great experience last fall where we ordered breakfast in. We always do breakfast because our meat and poultry hotline, call it 188. MP hotline if you have questions. Um, <laughs> nice plug. Yeah, so that opens at 10. So we always do a breakfast thing before our hotline opens. Um, so we had a great, fantastic experience with Grubhub. And the food came, and the eggs were still warm. And we, were, we just thought, oh, this is amazing. And then literally two weeks later, we did our, our holiday party. And the order was wrong. It took like two hours for it to come. It was just a whole drama. And we just decided after that that we weren't going to focus on any of those meal delivery options. And we were either going to go to the restaurant ourselves to pick up the food, or we we're going to go and have breakfast there. So, Good. Thanks. Thanks for that story. 
Do we have time for another story? Does anybody want to tell another story? She's coming. All right, this will, we'll, we'll end with this. Okay, so I have never ordered, I have never done this. I teach Serve Safe, and one of my restaurants had just signed up to use Grubhub, and their main concern was is the driver comes into their restaurant, brings his insulated bag in, it's covered in dog hair. <laughs> and he's very concerned because the driver from Grubhub delivers with the dog in the car. Oh. And there's yeah, no rules. Problem. And so he's, he doesn't understand, he doesn't know how to correct this issue. I'm, I'm writing this down for my committee. <laughs> Thank you. Pets in the car. <laughs> um, and, and I have to say, as soon as you said that comment about dog hair, I immediately looked down at my shoes <laughs> because uh, I carry my, my, the hairs of my dog from New Jersey around the world. Uh, she, I, she travels, I do as she well. travels with I have me, a so. yellow lab. So does a Chef Glick. Yeah. But, but that's an issue. Yep. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we address this? Because I, I don't think they have guidelines. Well, well, we're working on guidance, and, and yeah, I think the guidance should recommend that the pets not travel in the car, for sure. Yeah. Well, and my first question was, because it was in a rougher area. Oh, um, for safety. Right. Yeah. So, and he said, no, this is just his buddy. So. <laughs> Thanks. Talk about your risk-risk trade-off. Thank you. Well, if, if, uh, if that's it, if we're out of time and there's no more questions, uh, I'm sure we'll all be around at least for a little while afterwards if you wanted to corner us and ask some more questions. If not, please uh, join me in thanking uh, the panels.